Okay, welcome all. Uh, welcome to the fourth and the last session of the symposium uh, conducted by the Astronomy Club. Uh, this is our fourth and the last session. And for uh, the first talk, our speaker for today is Divita Gupta. Uh, Dr. Divita Gupta is going to talk about the gas phase astrochemistry, uh, kinetics of the reactions in cold ISM. Uh, Dr. Divita graduated from Iser Mohali in 2018, majoring in chemistry. She recently completed her PhD from University de Rennes, one, uh, France, studying low temperature gas phase kinetics of reactions relevant to astrochemistry. Uh, Divita, many congratulations for completing the PhD. Uh, she will soon be starting a new phase in her career and will be starting her postdoctoral research in astrochemistry. In today's talk, she will introduce and will discuss her work on low temperature on low temperature laboratory studies exploring reactions relevant to interstellar environments. It is always great to listen to her. And uh, with that, I will hand over to Divita Di. Over to you, Di. Thank you for such a kind introduction, Prajakta. <laughs> I'm just going to start my shares. Okay. Okay. Hello everyone. It's nice to see some people offline as well in person and online. Today I'll be talking about my PhD work, which focused on gas phase astrochemistry. So for the audience here, I'll start with some brief introduction to astrochemistry and especially gas phase astrochemistry, because I know all the talks you guys have been having are more focused on astrophysics and maybe astronomy as well. So this will be a little bit different than that. Uh, Okay, so the first, uh, so briefly, my out, the outline of my talk will go as follows. I'll start with kind of telling you how my work goes beyond astrophysics, and I'll provide the astrochemical background. Then I'll focus on the gas phase astrochemistry. And for that, I'll be talking about the experimental measurements that I have been a part of. And within the experimental measurements, we'll first, I'll first discuss how we reach those cold temperatures needed to measure those, uh, what I would need to do. And then I'll talk about measuring the reaction kinetics, observing reaction products, and then I'll also briefly talk about the collision dynamics as to how important that is in astronomy as well. So just very briefly, astrophysics is what covers the physical laws of nature, which is what you've been seeing in the previous talks. And even in the coming talks, you'll see that as well. This basically concerns the stars and various celestial bodies, for example, how do they form, what their properties are, and how they interact within each other as well. Astrochemistry goes a little further and it goes slightly differently. And it actually talks about the chemical interactions that occur in space. So what we cover in that is how the chemicals in the different star forming regions interact, how they interact, especially in a gravityless environment. All right. So the research for astrochemistry kind of falls onto these three pillars, which is observations, theory, and experiments. So observations, when you talk about observations, you have identification of species. So you have all these different species and here I'm actually showing a few of them. Let me just get my pointer as well. There we go. So you have all these different species which have been detected in space. And so what you have in observation is you want to identify what the various species are. So you have your signals, but you want to know what those different species are. This can be done both on based on absorption and emission spectroscopy, and also using different transitions. So these species can, can be identified using their, either their rotational vib uh, vibration or electronic patterns. So over here, if you focus a little bit on the bottom right, you'll actually see a plot of different species detected using different ranges. So for example, what you have over here is UV. So you have a couple of molecules, different sizes, detected in the UV range, in the visible range, in the IR range as well. But you'll see a, the biggest bunch of them actually come from the millimeter and centimeter range. And this is where the uh, rotation spectroscopy come in. All right. The next part is theory. So what you have in theory is either the construction and application of chemical models. So you know you have these different species in space, but you also want to understand how they are formed and how much their abundance is over a course of time. So you don't just have what you're measuring right now is either the present, right? What is there now? But you also want to see how that has evolved over time. So what you would have is different kinetic models. You would have different databases, which have all these species and their parameters. And what you also need is not just their chemical modeling, 
but for these chemical models, you need also the kinetics and you need the spectroscopic identification. So many of these species are actually so unique to space that you don't really have essentially the experimental measurements for the spectroscopy of it. So in those cases, you also need the theoretical spectroscopic parameters. So for the experimental part, what we need is we also need the same kind of thing we're trying to get from theory. That is, you want to understand the kinetics and spectroscopy parameters. And as I mentioned, especially for the exotic species. And then you have various kinds of reactions happening. You have the gas phase reactions and surface and ice phase reactions as well. And I'll briefly talk about them as well as we go on. So we have these three pillars, okay? So we have the observations which understand what species are there and then we identify them. And we can also measure the abundance of the species from the observational data itself, okay? Then we have theory and experiments, which also go hand in hand, talking about the astrochemical modeling and also understanding the kinetics and spectroscopy parameters. All right, moving on to the astrophysical environments. I'm pretty sure many of you will be familiar with this kind of a picture where you have basically different star formation regions, okay? You always have these diffuse clouds, which kind of are spread apart. And that is kind of why in the beginning, there was not supposed to, not, never thought to be that much chemistry happening because it was thought that the densities was too, was, were too low. So your molecules will actually not be able to react because for reactions, the basic idea for a reaction is to have collisions, okay? So two different species have to come together. They can either collide and just have a collision, like an inelastic collision, or they can actually react with each other and form a product, okay? And in these diffuse clouds, essentially, the density will be too low. So you really don't expect to have a lot of chemistry happening in these regions. But what ends up happening is these diffuse clouds actually come together and the molecules kind of form this denser clouds. And as this kind of continues on, you also form protostars, which basically all these materials kind of gravitate towards each other and they kind of start revolving with all the angular momentum they build up. They kind of revolving around, start rotating around each other. So what you would have is you would have a protostar, which will also have some outflows from the top and the bottom. As this process continues on, what you end up forming in the center of this is a young star, which will also have a disk around it. This then continues on with binary systems. So what you're happening in these regions is your molecules start to come together, but also your dust is starting to come together. And these dust particles essentially will start forming binary systems as well. And as you know, this then kind of destroys and you'll have an evolved star. So now within these different environments, what you actually have is a wide range of physical conditions. This is both in terms of densities and temperatures. So for example, in diffuse clouds, you will have anywhere from 10 to 100 molecules per centimeter cube. Whereas as you go on in the planetary systems and young protoplanetary proto disks called the young stars, what you would then have is somewhere around 10 part five, 10 part six molecules per centimeter cube. And even in terms of temperatures, in the diffuse clouds, you might, the outer regions might be quite hot, but the inner regions, as they are shielded from the UV radiation, they actually become much colder. And as you have stars as well, the temperature around the star will be much hotter and so on. And in the planetary systems, what you would also have is many of these planets actually do have enough gravity. So what you would then have is you would actually have these planetary systems, these planets, and even their moons, can actually have enough gravity to sustain an atmosphere there. So you would also have some, some chemistry going on there. Now that we know different densities and temperatures, what you would also have is a diverse chemical environment. So you would have reactions both going on in dust, ice, and gas. So for example, your dust particles over here, which can be either <clears throat> carbonaceous or silicate, what you would also have is you will have molecules sticking on top of each other, sticking on top of the dust particles. What you can also have is you can have these ices being formed from these molecules. And then you would also have these ice gas interplay as well. So you can really have a very rich chemistry going on. You can have it on dust surfaces, in pure ices, and even in gases, and even their interplays within each other. So till date, more than 250 detections have been done for various molecular species in the interstellar medium, which basically concerns the lower temperature region. And this, the densities of the molecules found in these cold temperatures is that is as low as 10 Kelvin. These abundances of the molecules found cannot be explained with the warm-up model. So for a long time, it was thought that most of the chemistry actually takes place on these surfaces. That means since these uh, particles or molecules can actually freeze out, 
they actually have a better chance of colliding with each other. So a lot of chemistry was thought to happen on these ice surfaces. But when you see these high abundances of different species found in the low temperature condition, that is up to 5 Kelvin, so what you can do, your, these warm-up models, that means when your ices are heating up, whatever is being evaporated or subliming out of the surfaces, it cannot explain the abundances. So that actually means there's a very rich gas phase chemistry also taking place. So that's how we will shift our focus now to more gas phase chemistry. And two of the main type of reactions which were thought to happen in the cold, cold temperatures is iron molecule reactions. So one of the ma major reasons why iron molecule reactions were thought to be quite important is because ions have electrostatic field. So it was, it was thought that since these ions have electrostatic charge, it will have a better probability of attracting a different species along with it. So it can induce some dipole moment. So that will actually help with interact, attracting another molecule and can form a reaction. And that is very much true. So iron molecule reactions actually are known to be one of the key uh, type of reactions taking place. And they are quite fast as well, even at this low temperatures. Another type of reactions is neutral neutral reactions. So this means none of the species is charged. However, one of them can be a radical, which are uncharged species. And to really predict the molecular abundances, like I said, for different species, we need to have the rate constants for these reactions over a wide range of temperature. And that is all the way down to 5 Kelvin as well. So why was neutral neutral gas phase chemistry the focus of my thesis? This is because it was only really becoming quite popular in the recent decades. And that is because under a Henius law, these reactions were thought to be too slow to proceed. And that is based on this kind of a picture that you have here. So what you have is you have your reactants and then they form a product. And even though this is an exothermic reaction, this does have an activation barrier. So for the reactants need to pass through this barrier to form the products, okay? But what will happen is if you have the log of the rate constant and inverse of temperature over here, so that means as you go on the right, you actually are going lower in temperature. So what would happen is as you are going down in temperature, your reactants will not have enough energy to cross these barriers. So this reaction essentially cannot proceed and they will become slower and slower. So your rate constant keeps on getting lower as you go down in temperature, okay? But now we actually know over the past few decades, like I said, that these many Uh, hello. Uh, is the visit uh, is the audible to the online audience? Okay, she got connected. Uh, connected. Okay. I think I was disconnected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you are disconnected. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Was it for a long time or just? Oh, now? No, 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 no. Just now. Just now. Okay, yeah, I think I had like an update available because I haven't Zoomed in some time. Let me reconnect. There we go. Is it good? Yeah, yeah. Around the, around like the first, first statement you explained and around the second statement you got disconnected. Okay, let me just... Uh... Do this. Okay, how is that now? Is it good? Yeah, yeah. we can uh, see the slides and we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's go back. So why does that happen? Why do some of these reactions actually become faster? So what would end up happening is you would have this non erroneous behavior, wherein the reactants actually can form a complex. And even though for forming the products, you will have a barrier, this barrier essentially will be lower in energy than that of your reactants, okay? So even though there is a barrier, that barrier is submerged within the reactant energy. So your reactants essentially in the beginning already do have enough energy to cross this barrier. So even at these low temperatures, they can actually take place, okay? So that's how you will see, you will actually have a heinous behavior up to a certain temperature over here, below which, actually your reaction can speed up. And that is in this case, because of the fact 
that at low temperatures, the low densities can actually work in your favor because your complex, which at room temperature might actually have a lot of collisions, will completely dissociate quite quickly. But at low temperatures with low densities, this complex can actually survive long enough because there is no enough, not enough density. Okay, so this complex can actually survive long enough to actually stay like this and then it can cross over to form the products. And it also does not need extra energy because the reactants already had it. Okay, so in this case, what will happen is as you go down in temperature, your reaction rate can actually increase. So that was completely new. And this only started, these measurements only came in the late 1900s, 1990s, basically, okay? However, why was this so late? This was late because this is very challenging both for experiments and theory. So for experiments, you need to go to these really low temperatures that is as low as 15, 20 Kelvin or five Kelvin. And even for theory, a lot of the chemical quantum uh, approximations that sometimes theoreticians like to use, they will no longer hold true. So a lot of processes like tunneling will also come into the picture, okay? So that is what we aim to do. We wanted to measure these kinetics, these reactions at low temperatures. And two of the main requirements you can already see is you want to go to these low temperatures. That is the first aim. And the second aim is to measure the products or the reactants as a function of time, which is what will give you the kinetics, okay? So let's focus on the first part, that is reaching the low temperatures. So for reaching the low temperatures, we, I use a technique called CRESO. This is a French acronym, which basically stands from reaction, for reaction kinetics in uniform supersonic flow. And this involves an expansion of gas through a Lavar nozzle. This design was actually used in rocket engines, okay? So many of these, this kind of a design, which is a convergent, divergent design over here, is used for the rocket engines to reach hypersonic speeds. Okay, so the gas passing through here will reach a hypersonic speed that helps with the propulsion, okay? In our case, what we did is apply that same idea for low temperatures. So what we had now is we had a gas which was at a higher pressure behind this region. It will have a um, conversion region over here and then a diversion region. So this will expand from here, okay? And this was used to actually not reach hypersonic, but just supersonic speeds. So what ends up happening is you have this, like I said, a high pressure region and a low pressure region, which is continuously pumped. And just based on the conservation of energy, what you will see is that the essential kinetic energy of the molecules in this region is kept to a zero, right? Because the molecules are diffusing in all directions. So your essential velocity here is zero. So your kinetic energy in this region is zero and all the energy is stored in terms of temperature, okay? But what will happen in this part is you have a supersonic speed of molecules and the molecules for the better part are very much collimated. So the whole energy is directional, okay? The kinetic energy is quite high. Uh, hello, is she an audible again for online audience? Yeah, we can. yeah okay, okay. Uh, some network issue from her side, I'll call her. So, I don't know why it's just, I think it's an update yeah, yeah. available, it's showing me. I'm yeah. so sorry. Okay, <laughs> you're back. Let me go back again. Hopefully, it won't do that again, but I don't know why it. I think it just keeps showing me a update, which I need should have done probably beforehand. Yeah, we can see the slides. Perfect. All right then. Okay, so what you then have is your temperature of the flow is really low, okay? And you've basically formed this really cold core. And to reach this, we actually have a continuous flow. So we have really huge pumps, okay? We have pumps and the gas flow for 20 to 100 liters per minute. And we need low flow, low, low pressures because we need to have the expansion. So we basically have really huge pumps, which can takes up like a whole room in a basement, okay? Which is pretty cool. So what you end up having is you have a sup uniform supersonic flow which can last anywhere from 10 to 70 centimeters. And the temperature can go all the way down to 10 Kelvin. 
and the density of the molecules in this region is 10 power 16 to 10 power 18 molecules. Okay, so here you can actually see the Cressu flow. You have the nozzle over here and you have electron beam excitation and you can see the molecules coming from here. Okay, from this nozzle over here. Perfect. So what we actually do with these nozzles, each nozzle is designed separately for different temperature and conditions. And actually we can even 3D print these nozzles in the lab. And these are quite well characterized, okay? So it has similar technology as what you have on airplanes to measure the pressures. We also have an impact pressure measurement, which really helps us uh, optimize what the density and the temperature in these nozzles and these flows are, which is pretty cool. So how do these measurements take place? For these measurements, we have our reactant. In this case, I'm showing benzene. And you have a reactant precursor. So this is the radical precursor. So what I will be talking about is a CN radical. And CN radical, you cannot just buy it off the market, okay? So what you actually need is you need a precursor to generate this radical. So you have a precursor, you have a radical, along with the buffer gas, which enter into this reservoir. You create a supersonic flow, and then you use an eczema laser, in this case at 248 nanometers, to create your radical, okay? This then starts the reaction, okay? The ICN or the precursor in this case will not react with your reactant. What will start the reaction is this eczema laser. So you have real good control over the timing when the reaction has begun. And then you use a dye laser to excite the CN radical. So you have a CN radical, you excite it, and then as it fluoresces down or as it relaxes, what you would have is a fluorescent signal. This fluorescent signal can be measured using a photomultiplier tube, and what you would get is a spectrum like this. And then you can just follow any of these peaks over time because you had a complete idea of when your reaction is starting. And that is with the eczema laser, you know when your zero of the reaction is. And then as you change the timing between when you're shooting it, when you're shooting the eczema laser versus when you're firing your dye laser, which is what measures the fluorescence, used to start the fluorescence, you can actually have a complete handle over time. And you can actually see the CN radical decreasing in a signal over time. This can be fit to an exponential. And this is done for different densities of the reactant. And that's how you can get your kinetics for a temperature, which is then repeated, like I said, for different nozzles, because each nozzle is particularly designed for a single temperature. Perfect. We have all we need. So let's look at the system that I was focusing on, and that is with CN radical with benzene, okay? The aromatics and cyclic species in the ISM are a very big topic, and that is because they are thought that many of these will actually form the dust particles as well. So this evolution from bigger dust particles to smaller pHs to smaller aromatic and cyclic, spe cyclic species is quite important. However, like I said, like if you remember back to the violin plot that we saw, okay, we saw that most of the molecules were actually detected using radio astronomy, okay, in the millimeter range, centimeter range. And that falls into microwave spectroscopy. And microwave spectroscopy actually needs a really good dipole moment or needs to have at least some dipole moment for the molecule to be detected. But as you can see in this case, many of these species actually will not have a big dipole moment or have essentially zero dipole moment. Even benzene, for example, has zero dipole moment. So you really cannot see these species directly using radio astronomy. It has been seen by IR in case of benzene, but not using radio astronomy. So what is the idea? The idea is we use cyanosubstituted species as a proxy, okay? This is not a tendence proxy. This is just for a molecule, you're using a proxy. So what you can essentially do is have a benzene ring, substitute that with a CN species over here, and this will actually induce a really good dipole moment to the species because CN is highly polar, okay? And this species was actually detected only in 2018 for the first time using radio astronomy in a torus molecular cloud where the temperature is all the way down to five to seven Kelvin, okay? However, the idea now is that you can use this abundance to kind of tell how much benzene was there. Because you want to say that the CN plus benzene is what is forming this product. So you can use this abundance as a proxy. But this needs to be verified, especially for the low temperature sources. So that's what we did. 
This species have already been detected in Titan, which is one of Saturn's moons atmosphere as well. So this is quite exciting. And the only previous study for this reaction was actually at 100 Kelvin and room temperature measurement. Okay. And there they already showed that this reaction is actually fast. But does this remain fast all the way down to low temperature as well? Which is what we did and which is what we saw. So we saw that actually this reaction, so over here you have the rate constant and here you have the temperature. So you can see the previous measurement was only till 105 Kelvin and we extended this all the way down to 15 Kelvin. And we actually saw that this reaction rate does not slow down. You do not see any lowering down over here, okay? This remains fast all the way from room temperature and all the way down to 15 Kelvin, okay? Which is quite exciting. So that basically what it means now is that you can use this reaction to actually estimate how much benzene could be there, okay? because this reaction is fast. All right, so that's what we did. And this was a great result in itself already, but we wanted to move a step further. Now, each reaction will not just have one pathway, okay? In this case, there was, and it has already been established during theoretical measurements as well, that the benzene CN only gives the benzonitrile product. But that's not always the case. What you can also have is you can have multiple channels. And these multiple channels then can have different reaction rates or different distribution. So what you would have is you have these different reaction rates and this then can further change over time. For example, you have this overall reaction rate over here, which is over temperature as it goes down, it might be increasing, but a different reaction channel could be contributing to this rise. A reaction channel, which may not be important at all at a room temperature, might become the most significant at room temperature. So you really need to understand which product is being formed at these low temperature and not just which reaction is important at room temperature, at low temperature, sorry. And this is quite important for astrochemical modeling because whenever these measurements are not there, the modelers essentially just use a equal ratio in all these channels, which as you can see in this hypothetical example, and actually is already known for some example like methanol plus OH, that this is no longer true. Okay, so in our lab in REN, my previous lab essentially, there were different techniques being used to, to measure the products. One of them was a cavity ring down spectroscopist. One was a frequency comb spectroscopist technique. Another was a photoionization mass spectrometry. However, I'll only be talking about this microwave spectroscopy technique, which is what I have developed along with my team over the past three years. So what happens here is you have a chirp pulse microwave spectroscopy, okay? This is a broadband technique. Basically what you do is you have this chirp which has a range of microwave radiation, okay? Different frequency ranges. So what you have uh, Hello, Dee. Okay, go on. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, okay, I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for this, but I don't know why it's doing that again and again. Let's go. Yeah. All right. So what you then have is as these molecules then, then kind of relax back, what you would have is a free induction decay. And this in time domain can then be Fourier transformed to see the different spectral lines wherever the transition for these molecules are, okay? And this is based on digital technology, so it's highly repeatable, quite stable, and very fast to measure. So that's what we did. And this is a picture you can see over here in early 2018. September, mid September 2018 is when I joined and it was an empty room. And then I left what I had, what we had is two different setups. We had the LIF measurement setup, which I already talked about, which was already there, just kind of changed from the basement to the first ground floor. And then what you also have is a Cresuchop apparatus over here as well. So we were, have, we have actually developed two spectrometers to be used now, one in the E band, which is 60 to 90 gigahertz, another in a K band, which is 26 to 40 gigahertz. So what you now have is you have a similar Leval nozzle, you have the flow, you have an eczema laser, which forms your radical. 
But what you now do is don't measure your C and radical concentration. Instead, you measure your products because you're sending out a chirp using your transmitter horn. And then in the receiver horn, you measure the FIDs and then can be Fourier transform, like I said, to measure the spectra. However, we had little progress simply with this kind of a setup. And that is because of the pressure conditions. The pressure conditions in the Cresu flow are quite high. And what happens is their FID signal, if you have really low pressure over here, that is 0 0.005 millibars, the FID is great. It lasts quite long, the signal is quite intense. However, even if you go up to 0 0.32 millibars, what you see is in the red over here, where your signal is very less and the FID goes away very quickly. So you do not have enough signal from this. So that's what we did. We actually now added a secondary expansion chamber to have even lower pressures. So what you have is you have a turbo molecular pump over here, which was used to pump another pump inside the huge chamber that we already had, okay? So your molecules are reacting in the Cresso flow. You're forming your products, which these products then expand and they enter a very even lower pressure condition. So we were actually able to see that we had much longer FIDs. These longer FIDs also meant the signal to noise ratio was quite good. So the pink, you see the, uh, the normal Cresu flow, the lines were very broad because of pressure broadening and the signal was less compared to in the skimmer chamber, which is a skimmed secondary expansion chamber where you have much narrower peaks and uh, much higher signal. And this is quite important for bigger species because that's what we want to do. And then I'll talk about the propene system that I worked on. So the, this reaction was already known to be very fast at low temperature. This is one of the measurements at 23 Kelvin. And, but this is actually known to have different reaction channels. So while this reaction rate is known, this is only the overall rate reaction, okay, rate of the reaction. So we know the overall rate is fast, but which product is being formed is what they wanted to explore. So one of the possible channels are addition channels where you have the CN radical which can add on to any of these carbons, the first, the second, and three, and then any of this hydrogen atom basically can leave, okay? So if this CN actually attacks on the first carbon over here, you're either this hydrogen over here or this hydrogen can leave, and you will have these two isomers sans, trans and cis, or you can have an attack on the second carbon, then either your hydrogen over here can leave, forming this two cyanopropene isomer, or your methyl group can leave, forming the vinyl cyanide product. What you can also have is on the third carbon, and in this case, you will have two conformers, cis and gauche, for the three cyanopropy. What you can also have, you can have a hydrogen abstraction channel, which basically means the CN will kind of abstract any of these hydrogens, and what you will be left with is a, a radical over here, and you will form HCN, okay? So that's what we wanted to do. And the only known, previous known measurement for this reaction is present at room temperature, where they actually saw that the vinyl cyanide channel was dominant, okay? But we wanted to verify this at low temperature as well. So we measured this reaction at 35 Kelvin, and what we saw is vinyl cyanide. So we see over here, you see in the here, the frequency, and you have a vinyl cyanide signature line over here at this frequency, and you can see that growing over time. This time is again marked by the eczema laser firing, okay? So as you see in time, you can actually see this product or the signal increasing over time. And you can see the time dependence where before the laser the signal was at baseline. And then as it goes on, you can see the product forming and then stabilizing as the reaction is completed, okay? We do know there are other products. However, we were not able to see it yet. So you see on, on the top over here is the experimental spectrum measured. And on the bottom is a simulated spectrum for different species we were expecting, but we do not see any of them over here, okay? But we do know they are present. They could be present because these channels were optimized with theoretical calculations. And we see that they are actually submerged channels over here. So you can have these different products. So this is very much a work in progress and there are still measurements being undertaken after me as well to kind of measure these different products. But we still wanted to calibrate this reaction. We still wanted to know how much the vinyl cyanide channel was contributing to this overall rate, okay? So we did that using another reaction, which is CN plus ethene, which is C2H4, 
which is already known to have the vinyl cyanide product channel, only have this channel, okay? So in black over here, you will see the vinyl cyanide uh, measurement over time, just purely from the ethene reaction, and then also from the CN plus propene reaction. So we could then use when the reaction has finished and how much these measurements was because our CN in both these was the same, okay? And from there, we were actually able to get that the vinyl cyanide reaction channel for this reaction was only contributing towards almost one fourth, okay? So there are, there are three fourth uh, other channels or the branching ratio, which is still left to be discovered where it's coming from. Okay, so we did that. So we've already covered two parts where ast astrochemistry can contribute. We need to have the overall rate constants. We need to know if the reactions are fast and which reactions are fast. We want to see which products are being formed. The third part where actually applied this setup was to also understand the collisional dynamics, okay? So like I said in the very beginning, when you have collisions, you have both things. You can have either reactions, the collisions leading to reactions, but what you can also have is inelastic collisions, okay? So that's what we'll study now. So we talking about the, the system, which is HCN and HNC. HNC is a transient isomer, which is a higher energy than the HCN, which is more stable and has a transition state, which kind of helps them go from one to another. The abundance ratio for these different molecules is kinetically controlled in the ISN. And that is again, because of the lower densities, you do not have thermal equilibrium, but what you will have is a kinetically controlled distribution. However, what, we, what is known is that these, both these species are produced from highly exothermic reactions. So that would mean whenever the product is being formed, there is enough energy for HNC to actually go and form an HCN, okay? So while in theory, it will be kinetically controlled, it's also exothermically uh, react, formed through exothermic reaction as well, which should mean that HCN should be higher than HNC. However, many of the measurements in the dark cold crowds uh, course has actually shown that HNC is actually higher. So even this exothermicity is not enough, okay? So why was this happening? That's what we wanted to explore. So what happens is whenever you have this collisional de-excitation of the system, okay? So when we saw helium is one of the major colliders in interstellar medium, okay? and this the excitation is kind of really governed by this radiative transfer equations, which are quite well pop like quite popular within the astrochemical modeling networks and everything. And this involves kind of calculating the competition between either the Einstein coefficients and the collision excitation. So you have spontaneous emission, absorption, and collisional de excitation. So you need to understand the competition between this bunch of A and B and the C. Beforehand, it was thought that both HC and HNC will have similar collisional excitation properties, and this is because they have very similar rotational constants and nearly the same dipole moments as well. However, it was kind of predicted theoretically that this picture might be inaccurate, that they may not have collisional excitation similar properties. So that's what we tried to explore experimentally. And what we did is we used the photolysis of final vinyl cyanide. So the species we saw earlier actually forms both HCN and HNC when it is photolyzed at 193 nanometers. And we actually saw in the time domain data when you have this FID is really affected by the pressure broadening parameters, okay? So we could actually fit this time domain data using a void profile, which has components of both Doppler shifting and the pressure broadening because the T2 time essentially is related directly to the pressure broadening factors, okay? So we had these time domain data, we could fit that to get this, and then this T2 could actually also give us the pressure broadening parameters. So that's what we saw. We fitted those, and we actually saw that these decay profiles for HCN and HNC were actually quite different. We did these measurements all the way down to 10 Kelvin from 70 Kelvin. And you can actually see over here that HC, HNC, which is in blue over here, has much higher collisional cross-sections than compared to HCN, okay? We were able to explain that with theoretical measurements as well, but I won't go into that, okay? So this is the first measurement which was able to do for HNC. 
and the uh, it's again actually quite agrees well with the previous measurements or the previous measurement at higher temperature not so well with the lower temperature this is for right. pollutional de excitation yes okay thanks yeah, okay so with that i will end my talk with just some of the behind the scenes pictures of a work in progress especially because it was a setting up project as well the excitement over here when you have some first time signals and also using a cranes because you have to move the different lasers so to summarize astrochemistry is a very vibrant field and it kind of amalgamates different fields coming together it's both physics chemistry and sometimes even astrobiology which i haven't even talked about at all and there's plenty more to be done a lot of collaboration is needed and like i said there's a summing cap over here which i wanted to highlight as well with that i would like to thank my team without which this would not have been possible the scientific and technical team as well and astronomy club and the conveners co conveners and the organizing committee for the symposium for inviting me and the funding sources thank you uh thank you very much dee for this talk uh yeah uh so has so have his hand raised so so you can ask the question So Devita, a uh, wonderful talk. Uh, Thanks. Now, in this, uh, th there were two things which I want to understand. One is that in the experiment <laughs> which you are doing, mm -hmm. the molecules are actually moving very fast, yes. but the temperature is low because the fast motion is essentially uh, bulk motion, yes. and it does not matter, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that was one part. The other was. are there uh, groups which are doing uh, theoretical calculations of the uh, kinetics of these molecules yes there are actually there is even like a lot of uh, master equation packages which okay. are being used so one of the things i am actually involved with is like getting the propene surf like potential surfaces <laughs> and then using master equations to kind of predict how much uh, their rates would be at lunar temperature so that is very much a field as well okay okay yes uh yeah but without the rates being measured experimentally essentially those theoretical estimates cannot go very far yes i think there are limitations so what uh, some of the packages actually aim to do and one of the packages i know how to kind of work with is uh, a mesmer program so where you actually what you do is you have these theoretical rates but since there are so many possibilities what it will also do it will not because the accuracy is quite difficult as well right because when you're working with bigger systems you can only go so high with that accuracy right. so what some of the packages can do is they can take the experimental measurements into account along with these measurements and then be used to kind of really estimate exactly how much these barriers are so even if you have just a couple of temperate measurements for a couple of temperatures that can be used alongside with theoretical measurements plus the experimental measurements to really help kind of uh, tell how much these barriers would be to get like even more accurate theoretical values right right yeah. good sounds good yeah. thank you <laughs> thank you uh, does anyone from offline audience have a question yeah uh yeah hi di uh, so i had a simple hi. question so as i understand it so astrochemistry is mostly based upon uh, obtaining and analyzing spectral data right from various sources in some sense sorry your voice was getting cut for it is could you repeat yeah uh, so astrochemistry as i understand it is based upon obtaining and analyzing spectral data from various sources in the universe am i mean, is that audible we couldn't hear you again uh, we'll have to go again. oh uh, are, am i am i is our side uh, audible Yeah, I think now is better. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I had a simple question. So uh, astrochemistry is basically based upon obtaining spectral data and analyzing that spectral data from various sources, right, in the universe. So uh, the spectrum yeah. which Part travels through the space, it basically tra travels through the ISM, and uh, there are many sort of entities in the ISM itself. Uh, so. doesn't the data sort of get contaminated in some sense so how do you work around that okay so that is kind of uh, by astronomers mostly and that is done in a way because when you see you have different ism sources along the path so for example if your telescope is somewhere here and your source is somewhere here since these different ism as you go in radially they will have 
different radial distances. So these different radial dis dis distances will also have different velocities as they are moving. Okay. So when you are actually measuring with the telescope, what you can actually do is you can actually segregate this data from other sources because the source which is anywhere closer than, than the source you are trying to measure, that will move much slower, right? Sorry, much faster compared to anything which is behind it. So that actually helps different radial velocity uh, factors can actually help you distinguish between what is coming from where. So even within these ISM sources, so even if you're measuring one source, even then you can have different radial velocities as well. So you can actually resolve those parameters based on the distances there. But that is more done with some parts of in interferometry, which is more astronomers. Yes. Yeah, that makes I sense. I hope that answers some part of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, does anyone? Yeah, you can. Um... Oh, that's a very wonderful talk. So I have a very few Thanks. basic questions. So one thing is uh, like the lab experiment that you are doing, there mm -hmm. the molecules are most moving uh, in a bulk motion. How good are yes. these in terms of astrophysical context where we believe that the, it is random motion? So are the rate depends on the density or this parameter or not? That's a very great question actually. So what we are trying to do is we definitely do not have the same conditions that what you would have in the ISM, okay? And that is basically because what our aim is quite different. Our aim is to get those reaction parameters in an isolated way, okay? So we're not trying to simulate the exact densities there. What we're trying to do is have enough densities that we could actually have thermal equilibrium because we don't want any kinetic part there. Okay, we don't want, we want to have a thermal equilibrium there. So we can actually understand the reaction kinetics of a single reaction in an isolated sense. So for those part, this is very much true. Okay, but what you would have in space will not be a thermal equilibrium reaction, right? You will have kinetic, but to understand the kinetic aspect of it, you need to have a thermal rate coefficients for different reactions as well. And then that can further be extended to understand the kinetic at low pressure conditions. Is that clear? Is it? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, very good. Yeah. So the second one uh, okay. is like, how good are I mean, how good are the temperature measurements? Like you are saying that 10 Kelvin or something in the astrophysical environment, 10, 20 Kelvin. And at the same time, you also. Claim... Sorry, your voice is getting cut again. Okay. So the question is, can you hear me now? Yeah. Now it's better. Yes. Yeah. So the other question is like. How good are these temperature measurements that you claim? I mean, it's okay, like 20 Kelvin or 50 Kelvin where these molecules can reside, right? Is there any degeneracy between the temperature measurement and the number density that is required for these molecules to form? Sorry, it's your voice is still getting cut quite a bit. I've only understood your question partially. Okay, so I will repeat, okay. So yeah. my question is that, Often there is a degeneracy between the temperature measurement and the number density, the density of the particle. I mean, the molecules are atoms that are around. So how good mm -hmm. are the, how well constrained are these two in terms of astrophysical measurement from these objects? Uh, I think what, so this is completely not my focus, okay? But what I'm, I can tell you is what my brief understanding of this is. In our setup itself, we have an accurate measurement of the temperature because we know exactly the fluid dynamics taking place here. We know this is isotro isentropic expansion. So we can actually use the pressure measured over here to kind of get those values. So we know these temperature values and density values. Tempera basically what you're measuring is the pressure and the densities, and then that can be used to understand the temperature. So we know that is quite well calibrated. I know in space, they use uh, more of the system they think are in equilibrium and kind of use that but my knowledge is quite limited as to, I can't, I don't think I can tell you without having doubts in those. So I'll probably refrain from that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, does anyone from the online audience have any question? Okay, right. Uh, so I think uh, we can move on to the next session. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Dee. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our second section, second session of the of this uh, of the fourth session of the symposium uh, by Pranav Kreti. 
So I will uh, invite Amir from MS20 Bash to invite uh, Pranam. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. A very good evening. And I welcome you to this session of the symposium. So the next talk is based on gas and life cycle of radio galaxies. And it's my pleasure to invite Pranab Kukreti from MS13 Batch to talk on the same. Pranab graduated from Aysir Mohali in 2018, majoring in physics. He's currently a PhD student at the Captain Astro Institute and Astron in Netherlands, studying the gas and life cycle of radio galaxies, especially the galaxies that show multiple phases of activity. In today's talk, he will give an introduction to radio agents and their life cycle, providing an overview of the study of the life cycle of radio galaxy 3C293. He will discuss the study of his research group of a peculiar case of radioactivity in the ULI RG Mark 273. He will also, in brief, talk about his ongoing project to connect the life cycle of radio galaxy with its gas properties. With that, I will hand it over to Pranav. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, I will now share my screen. See, no. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, your screen is visible. You see the presentation? Yeah. yeah? See the presentation. Okay. Great. Uh, I'm using double screen, so I'm a bit confused as to how this works now. Just a second. Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. You can probably try to make it full screen. That would be better. Yeah. 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 Great. Are you able to see it now? Yeah. Awesome. And do you see my cursor moving across the image? Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, for this symposium. I'm very happy to be here back in Asamwali after a long time. Um, I'm sorry that the title and in fact, the abstract of my talk has slightly changed because I realized that it's better to talk about the life cycle of radio galaxies itself for about the half an hour that I have. And uh, if I can bring that idea across very well, that would be good enough. Uh, so I will be refraining from discussing gas mostly, maybe just one slide on it at the end. Uh, and yeah, and uh, okay, let's get started then. Okay. So, as you already saw or heard uh, um, my introduction, I'm a third year PhD student at the Captain Astronomical Institute uh, in the University of Groningen, that's in the Northern Netherlands, and at Astron, which is the Radiance Astronomy Institute of Netherlands. Here you can see the nice picture of Astron with a very uh, old and famous Dwingaloo dish right next to it. I did my BSMS from ISER in 2018, and for my master's thesis as well, I worked in radio astronomy. I worked with Professor Jajid Bagla on uh, the star formation rates in uh, normal star forming galaxies. But now I've shifted my focus for my PhD completely to, in some sense, the polar opposite objects called active galactic nuclei. So in this talk, I'll try to give you an idea of active galactic nuclei, especially radio AGNs and then show or uh, try to show it to you that they go through phases of activity. They have a life cycle where they are born and they die and they are born again. And then uh, what we currently understand about them and what we don't understand about them. And uh, then I'll summarize with uh, future outlook for these kind of objects. So active galactic nuclei, the first question is what are active galactic nuclei? Um, these are, so out of the billions of galaxies that we have in the universe, there are about 10 to 15% that shine with extraordinary luminosity. Now, these galaxies in their, in their nuclear region, they host a supermassive black hole, which means the black holes that are about the size of a million to a billion times the mass of the sun. So these supermassive black holes at the center of the galaxy are accreting material from its surroundings, by which I mean that there is hot gas around the black hole that's being accreted as it revolves around the black hole and it then is slowly eaten up by it. This process of accreting and other processes that follow from this, uh, they release a huge amount of energy. 
uh, from this uh, nuclear region of the galaxy. In fact, in some cases, it can even outshine, this Aegean can even outshine the entire galaxy, all the stars and gas and dust in the galaxy. And here you can see a diagram, which a cartoon representation of the Aegean, which, um, which shows the black hole in the center. Uh, and then there is some red color accretion disk around it, which is where the hot gas is, which emits at X-ray and a UV wavelengths. Then we have uh, in some kind of, in some agents, we have a dusty torus, which is what we call, uh, which, which is uh, bright in infrared. And around this region, we have gas clouds that we see in different optical emission lines. And in some cases of agents, we see these jets, jets of relativistic plasma moving outside, perpendicular to the uh, plane of the accretion disk. Um, so, as I said, these uh, AGNs release enormous amounts of energy that can even outshine the entire galaxy, and they emit across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So, depending on how you see in which frequency you're looking at the AGN, the AGN would appear different to you. Kind of like the story about the elephants and five blind men trying to look at an elephant separately and uh, thinking that the elephant looks uh, different. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum. You can see the basic buildup of how we define the spectrum, um, starting from radio waves, moving on to infrared, ultraviolet, and optical, and then X-ray and gamma. What I focus on uh, for my PhD primarily is this section, which is radio waves, so waves going from about 100 meter to about a centimeter uh, wavelength. These are very long uh, wavelength radio waves for uh, yeah for typical astronomers. So to give you an example, I will show you this Aegean, which Hercules A, which is one of the most one of the most famous Aegeans uh, in the sky. This image that you are seeing is taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, the wide field camera on Hubble Space Telescope. It combines two optical filters. It's a composite of two optical filters from the telescope. In the center, you can see the galaxy itself that hosts the Aegean. It's, it, you can see a very bright region in the center here, surrounded by diffuse morphology on the side. In the optical, it doesn't look very interesting. It just looks like a diffuse blob in the sky. But if you were to go to the radio, you would see something very different. This is a radio image of the same source with a very large array, which is a radio telescope in New Mexico in USA. This image is made at a radio frequency of, of four to nine gigahertz. So if you think of it for reference, the microwave oven in the canteens work at about two and a half gigahertz and the Wi-Fi that you're using right now is about two and a half to five gigahertz. It's pretty much the same frequency. And these frequencies, if you were to look at the AGNs, they would show you these really bright jets that you wouldn't see otherwise mostly, and then diffuse emission around them, uh, which we call the lobes. So you can see that just by moving to a separate uh, frequency, we can see a completely different side of the galaxy. So what are radio AGNs then, which are the focus of what I'm working on? These, so out of all the AGNs that exist, there's a fraction of AGNs that are extremely bright in the radio. The, by extremely bright, I mean their luminosities can go are mostly more than 10 to the power 23 watts per hertz, which is usually considered uh, very high for uh, normal star forming galaxies. So compared to normal star forming galaxies, these are much brighter in the radio. And, and that's why these radio loud agents are some of the most luminous radio sources known. Here, a diagram shows the basic buildup of a radio AGN. This is a very famous, another famous radio galaxy called the Cygnus A. At the center, you can see the core of the galaxy, which is where the supermassive black hole and the accretion disk and the gas clouds reside in a very small region in this core. Moving outwards, we see jets coming out of this galaxy, which are uh, which is a very fast relativistic flow of uh, hot plasma made up of electrons and of course the positive counterparts. Um, 
these jets are made up of plasma and magnetic field and they are a very well collimated flow that travels to tens of kiloparsecs of distance before it slows down it gets more diffuse more turbulent and then it forms these structures that we call lobes you see at the end we see two diffuse uh, emitting structures these lobes are fueled by the jets coming from the core and at the end of the lobes sometimes in some powerful objects we can see very bright features uh, these bright features are called hot spots and they are formed as the jets the jet material traveling at relativistic speeds interacts with the ambient medium and leads to shocks so we don't see them in all sources but in some very uh, powerful sources these are seen pretty clearly so this is one kind of radio agn uh, not all radio agents are as clear cut in their structure some are very confusing and they come in all shapes and sizes so to give you an idea this is a small zoo of radio galaxies you can see there's on the left if you look at the left top image you can see there is a bright jet moving out but then it wiggles and uh, then it gets more diffuse which we call plumes and then it's too faint to be detected after that there's also these wide angled objects which we see uh, bending away uh, in the same direction uh, again there's bohr um, classical radio galaxies with bright hot spots at the end the one in the center is actually uh, one of the most uh, famous uh, radio galaxies known called centaurus a this is a huge radio galaxy very close to us so this is at least 6 to 7 times bigger than the moon uh so if you could see in the radio you would see this much bigger than the moon in the sky uh this has very diffuse uh, very diffuse radio lobes being fueled by these bright regions you see here and the fact that it's so close to us has been very good because we've been able to study uh these lobes that uh, these jets that fuel the lobes in much more detail than before and again more kind of radio galaxies on the right which basically comprise the zoo so now uh, the question is why radio agents why should we care about radio agents um like i said these jets and uh, lobes are made up of relativistic plasma so they contain a high amount of energy although this energy itself is only a small fraction of the total luminosity of the agn but this these jets given their high energy and high velocity can still interact with the surrounding medium of the host galaxy which means that as they travel from the core as they leave the galaxy and move to uh, larger scales they will interact with the gas around them uh, they can heat the gas around them they can make it more turbulent uh, and prevent star formation because you need gas to cool down and collapse to form stars if the gas is heated and made more turbulent you can in effect stop star formation in uh, in these galaxies these agents can also drive really fast gas outflows uh, which are basically collections of gas clouds moving at really high speeds outwards from the galaxy thus again they can really quench the galaxy of its ma gas mass as well so to give you an idea i have a small movie here to give you an idea of how these jets move out and form these uh radio structures that we see let's see if it plays yeah so you can see it's starting from the center and then you see these jets bright jets moving out they are moving out at relativistic speeds and as they move out they slow down they the flow becomes more turbulent it's more diffuse and these it leads to the formation of these wide structures at the end and what we observe is this entire radio galaxy and this process although is happening in a few seconds here it takes tens to hundreds of million years for uh, especially the largest objects to form okay so like i said before uh, radio jets interact with the surrounding medium uh, i have two more tiny movies to show you uh, simulations to show you to convey this idea so they uh, not only do radio agents come in different shapes and sizes they also have different powers and depending on the power uh the power decides how 
collimated and how strong the jet flow is. So in terms of jet power here, you can see two, two uh, simulations. On the x-axis, we have the radio power. So on the one on the left is a low radio power uh, jet. One on the right is a higher radio power jet. Uh, on the y-axis, we have the ages, which I now realize is not very relevant for this uh, simulation at the moment. But uh, anyway, so the, I'm going to show one on the left first. It's a low power jet, and it gives you a clear idea of how, as the blue jet is trying to move out of this uh, dense medium that is uh, in the galaxy, it disturbs the medium, and it, it itself gets disturbed. So there's re reactions happening both ways. You see it starts off uh, as a much more collimated flow than it ends up as. And in the end, we just have very diffuse uh, emission outside the host galaxy. And it also takes about, in the simulation, about more than 3 million years to make it outside the host galaxy. Whereas if you have a high power jet flow, you see how easily it can, it's much more collimated. It can easily just uh, rip through the ISM uh, in some sense. And we can then see the very well collimated jet structures we see outside the host galaxy. Okay, so hopefully by now I've sort of convinced you that radio agents, what radio agents are, and then convinced you that radio agents are important for studying galaxy evolution in general, because a lot of, not only uh, they disturb the ISM uh, here, but there are a lot of simulations that use, that try to understand galaxy evolution and they use agent feedback as a way of quenching uh, star formation in these galaxies. So understanding AGN feedback is very important for which we need to understand AGN, how the AGN's feedback as well. What I haven't talked about yet is the origin of the radio emission. So what are the physical processes in these radio galaxies that are causing the radio emission? There are multiple physical processes that make up the complete radio emission we see from these galaxies. Depending on what scale you're looking at, different physical processes are dominant. The one I'm going to talk about, which is most relevant for this talk, is synchrotron emission. Some of you might have studied synchrotron emission in your electrodynamics course by now, and some of you will, but the broad idea of a synchrotron emission is that you have a relativistically moving charged particle, in this case an electron, and if it's in a magnetic field, uh, synchrotron theory, and uh, by Larmor's formula, I think you can evaluate how a charged particle moving in a magnetic field will emit electromagnetic radiation because it's accelerating. So in the case of synchrotron emission, that electron uh, radiation, the one we see here is uh, radio waves, although it can even go to higher frequencies. Uh, so this diagram, this cartoon tries to show the electron and then the magnetic field uh, around which the electron is moving and the radio waves that come out. So the galaxy that I showed you, Hercules A, these structures in magenta and pink, the dominant source of emission here is synchrotron emission, which is these uh, relativistic electrons and, and that are moving in the magnetic field. And by this distance, they are sub-relativistic, but still fast enough to make a synchrotron emission. The way we study this synchrotron emission is by trying to look at its spectra. By spectra, I mean you have on the x-axis frequency, on the y-axis you have the intensity of the emission. So if you were to look at one electron, you would see on the top right, you see this curve, that would represent the synchrotron emission of one electron. But of course, in, the, in, a, in a galaxy, you have billions and billions of electrons. So it's a huge population with a big energy distribution. And when you what you observe when you look at these galaxies is a sum of all the individual synchrotron emitting electrons. So this what you would observe is this orange line here, which is the sum of all these uh, synchrotron emitting electrons. The way we parameterize this spectrum is uh, using something called the spectral index. So the intensity of this spectrum goes as nu to the power minus alpha. The nu is the frequency. Alpha is the spectral index, which is the slope of the spectrum. So you see the orange line. Alpha is the slope of this spectrum. So if alpha was steeper, it would you know, come down uh, at a, with a steeper slope. If alpha was 
lower, closer to zero, it would be flatter. Typically in radio emission from, um, uh, from radio galaxies, from active radio galaxies, we see spectral indices of 0.5 to 0.8. But the good thing about synchrotron spectra is that it also shows signs of aging. These electrons that are emitting the radiation, they lose their energy, the energy losses in these electrons scale as nu square, which basically means that higher energy electrons, higher frequency that are emitting at the high frequencies will lose their energy much faster than the lower energy electrons in the same population. So in effect, what you have on the plot in the right is again frequency on the x-axis and uh, intensity on the y-axis. The first line that you see, the solid line, is a model for synchrotron emission from a radio galaxy that is uh, in an active state. So it's been switched on for about 50 million years. This is what the spectrum would look like. Now, if the activity were to stop, the radio galaxy were to die in some sense, uh, then the fueling of electrons would stop and the energy losses will dominate, especially at higher frequencies, because they lose energy much faster than lower frequency electrons. So you'll see that the dot dashed line now, after 10 million years, we call the remnant, the dot dashed line is has a steeper index. And then as we move on to more, uh, to more aging electrons, let's say after about 50 million years, the spectrum gets even steeper. And we can now see that uh, there is like a break here in the synchrotron spectra as well. By break, I mean uh, uh, the point where the spectra changes drastically. So in, the, in such steep spectrum, we typically see a spectral index of 1.2 to 1.5, but it can go even steeper depending on how old the electrons are. So the magenta and blue lines that you see here are basically two telescope frequencies. Uh, where we can measure the spectra. And you can see that if we measure spectra on two different frequencies, so if you measure at high frequencies, we can understand the, how the spectra is steepening and therefore understand how old the galaxy itself is because the older it is, the steeper it is. Uh, at low frequencies, we can understand, we, are, we can understand uh, how how young the galaxy is in some in some sense because it can let us understand uh, because it, it it ages the least it can allow us to understand how young the galaxy is so if we if we can model the spectrum we can understand the ages of these galaxies and thus we can try to understand how the life cycle of these galaxies is going on so but how do we do this is actually by using radio telescopes at different frequencies. The one I primarily use is uh, called LOFAR. It stands for Low Frequency Array because it observes at very low frequencies from about 10 megahertz to 250 megahertz. Now, these are the same frequency, like frequencies also at which your car radio works. If you remember 98.3 and all these FMs, they work at similar frequencies. So at such low frequencies, the sky again looks different than at high frequencies. And LOFAR is a special instrument for this purpose because as you can see uh, on the image in the right, it has stations here in the Netherlands because it was a Dutch project, but then it also has stations spread out all over Europe, pretty much, uh, north, northwestern Europe. So you have in UK, France, Spain, Germany, Italy, Latvia, Sweden, and there are plans to expand it even more. So the idea is that we can now mimic a dish as big as entire Northwestern Europe. So this allows us to have great resolution. We can go from sub arc second resolution of about 0.3 arc seconds to six arc seconds, 20 arc seconds simultaneously. And we also have great sensitivity, which about 100 microjans to the beam, which is very good at uh, 50 to 100 megahertz frequencies. Ah, I have a short movie to give you an idea of what LOFAR looks like. Let's see. So these are the LOFAR antennas in uh, in Shide, in Netherlands. These are the high band antennas that observe at about 200, uh, one, uh, 100 to 200 megahertz. These black tiles that you see.
it's very different from conventional radio telescopes, which have dishes and are mechanically move around. Yeah, so that was low far. Uh, I also use other telescopes uh, for higher frequency where I can model the spectrum as it ages. For instance, we use VLA, which is in New Mexico in the US. And some of you might remember it from this very famous Jodie Foster movie, Contact, where she's, you can see in the background, she's looking for uh, little green men using the VLA. Uh, and another, and one of the biggest radio telescopes in the world is actually in India. Uh, called the UG, UGMRT, which I guess quite a few of you would know already, uh, near Pune. And using these, uh, using these telescopes, we can then sample the spectrum at a variety of frequencies, which allows us to model the spectrum, and then we can figure out what ages it has. So, okay, that's the physics part of it, uh, of, of radio AGNs that I wanted to discuss. Uh, now I'll quickly try to give you an idea of the life cycle of radio agents. So what we have seen so far, all the radio agents I've shown you are typically are in their evolved active phase, which means you can see, uh, where's my cursor? Yeah, you can see the jets and you can see this diffuse emission around the jets. At some point in their life, the jets switch off and then we just have the diffuse emission. This diffuse emission is not being fueled by the central agent anymore. So it ends up getting older, which means the spectra steepens, it gets faint and it's harder to observe. But of course, uh, we know that radio agents restart, which means for some reason their activity is started again. Uh, depending on how long, how long it takes for the agents to restart, we can observe them in different phases, in different kinds. So if they start very quickly, then we can see a new phase of activity in the center before the older phase of activity has even faded out. So we can see two phases of activity at the same time. This is what we call the restarted phase. And if it starts after a very long time and the diffuse emission has faded away, then we just see the young radio galaxy in the center. So this is what it basically would, this is how it would relate to the, to the spectrum I showed you before. Active phase would be here, this A, the remnant phase, would be here, this B, and the remnant ages. And then depending on when the galaxy restarts, it can, of course, have, uh, have different spectra. But the broad idea, the, uh, the reason why we want to understand this is because radio agent life, cycle, life cycles happen over the time scales of 10 to 100 millions of years. A galaxy's lifetime is billions of years. So if radio agents are to have a significant feedback on the light on the, during the lifetime of the galaxy, they have to have multiple epochs of activity. They have to have multiple phases uh, just because their active phases are too short compared to the lifetime of the entire galaxy. So uh, this slide, I'm not going to go a lot in detail, uh, but I'm going to tell you the life cycle in a nutshell. Like I said before, this diagram basically shows the same idea that you have young radio galaxies that age to become adults, uh, then a big fraction of them uh, switch off, uh, or not, sorry, not a big fraction, but a big fraction are short-lived. Um, and then they become remnants, which are characterized by their old aging plasma that we can observe. Then the activity switches on again, and it's uh, it, we see young radio galaxies again. So on the right, you see a typical classic example of a restarted galaxy. called a, It's called a double-double radio galaxy in the sense that we see two different pairs of jets and lobes. So you see one pair inside here and one pair outside. The pair inside is understood to be the younger phase of activity and the pair outside is the older phase. Um, in some cases, we even see uh, a very steep spectral index in these old, old phases, which is how we know that they are old. And in some cases, uh, we don't see any, uh, any old emission at all. So that's the current picture, typical picture of uh, restarted radio galaxies that uh, it's, it's very simplistic, like the cartoon would, uh, cartoon would have shown. But now we, are going, now we are realizing that the story is not that simple. And we found this in my first project uh, for, a galaxy, for a famous galaxy called 3C293. 
This is a very bright radio galaxy in the sky. Uh, on the left, you can see in the top the large scale uh, emission from this galaxy. We were able to observe this with LOFAR uh, on multiple scales. And we were able to observe the multiple phases of activity in this galaxy down to very low frequencies. So these lobes are the older phases. And as you zoom in, in some sense, with the, with the bigger, uh, bigger telescopes, you can see the younger phases of activity inside, which are these uh, jets and lobes. Um, surprisingly, what we found was that these, this galaxy did not show any signs of uh, any spectral uh, signs of a typical restarted galaxy, because we would have expected that these lobes would be very old if they are a restarted galaxy and would show significant signs of aging. But on the plot in the right, what I'm showing is the same galaxy, but the colors are spectral indices. Now, all you have to take from this plot is that in oh, oh, throughout this huge in, uh, radio galaxy, the spectral index is not changing much. It's about 0.6 to 0.8. It's not showing signs of aging, which we would expect because people think it's a restarted galaxy, so we would expect to see that. And it's showing a very uniform distribution, all of which was very confusing. So we know that this galaxy does not fit the typical restarted model. Uh, the one way we understand or we try to explain this is that there are two scenarios possible. One is that the galaxy has restarted very quickly and then it has not had enough time to age, although we don't know why it would restart very quickly. But if that happens, then we can expect to see, or we can expect to not see uh, signs of spectral aging, but it still wouldn't very well explain the uniformity we are seeing in the, in the, in the lobe here, this uniform spectral index. The other is that the galaxy never switched off and people thought it was restarted, but it was never really switching off, it was active at a very low level so as to give the appearance of restarted galaxies. Uh, I'm going to skip this. This is not really useful right now. And yeah, so recently, this is not the only galaxy. There are now more objects that have been discovered because now we have telescopes that can really resolve these objects over multiple frequencies. So more such objects have been discovered recently, as you can see on the screen. Uh, and although we don't understand what's exactly going on. The, the idea that's uh, one of the ideas is that all of these galaxies have very dense ISM. They have very dense host galaxies. So the jets of these galaxies are being disturbed by this dense ISM and they get more turbulent, which leads to a more uniform spectral index distribution as they move out to larger scales. But this is still a very um, new subgroup of restarted galaxies that we are looking at. And uh, we'll, in, in the coming years, the new surveys, we'll see much more. So this concludes the part about the radio life cycle. And I just have now one slide on the connection with the gas part, uh, like I promised in the abstract. Uh, right now, we are trying to basically understand what's happening in these galaxies. And not just this, but overall in all radio galaxies that show life stages. We are trying to split radio galaxies into stages of life cycle. So in this plot, I show the spectral index at two different frequencies X, uh, on X and Y axis. And just by where these galaxies are on this plot, we can figure out or at least get an idea of what stage of their life cycle they are in. So now the idea is to split our sample into different stages. So we can have, uh, uh, we can talk about it in a statistical sense. And then we look at their gas properties. So. For gas properties, we want to look at the O3, which is um, oxygen, uh, uh, the second ionized state of oxygen around the central engine in these galaxies, um, and the H1, that is the neutral hydrogen in these galaxies. So the idea is that once we can separate them into different life cycle stages, we can trace their gas properties because we have information about their gas properties. We can understand how the gas kinematics behaves, how fast the gas is, how the uh, and if the gas changes as the source grows, and we can also probe the star formation of the host galaxy. If you have questions about this, I can answer, but I think I will now finish with the summary slide here. Uh, so yeah, I hope I conveyed 
the idea that radio galaxies are important objects and they have multiple phases of activity. And the fact that they can affect the host galaxy makes it important to understand their life cycle, which is not as simple as we thought before. There are objects that do not fit our understanding of restarted galaxies. And now we need more such objects to understand, uh, to understand this life cycle. And it's, it's an exciting time to be a radio astronomer because this is now the era of deep wide field surveys. We have so many instruments all over the world doing incredible uh, surveys. We have uh, LOFAR in, the, in Europe. We have a Perthif in Netherlands, UGMRT in India. We have MITE uh, in uh, South Africa with Meerkat, which is doing uh, incredible science. EMU and FLASH in Australia, which are SKA precursors. And all of these surveys are, all of these instruments are very good for detecting such, uh, such galaxies with very high sensitivity and resolving the emission. And the great thing is that they are all at very different frequencies, so we can really model the synchrotron emission from these galaxies very well in a detail that was uh, never done before. So I would like to conclude with this. Thank you for listening. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, it was a very detailed talk and I'm, I'm pretty sure most of us would have been able to follow it throughout. Uh, Bagla sir has his hand raised, so, so you can unmute and ask. Hi Pranav, good to see you, hear you. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> nice talk. Thank you. Uh, the work which you mentioned in the last slide, uh, you will need to have uh, uh, basically use not only the LOTS uh, data, but also uh, VLA first data and optical. So how many objects do you have where, where you essentially have uh, uh, cross identification? Yeah. So, yeah. So the currently we have about 150 objects for which we have cross identification, uh, O3 and H1. Well, not H1 for all, but yeah, we have uh, cross identification across three radio surveys and with SDSS. Um, the, so this project that I'm doing right now is a pilot to explore this idea. And the plan is to actually expand it. Thanks to lots, we can expand it to really low luminosity objects and at least increase the sample by an order of magnitude to be able to study low luminosity objects, which form the majority of radio agents. Uh, and I'm pretty confident that we'll have a much larger sample uh, in the next year or so. Do you plan to do follow-up at higher frequencies using UGMRT, EVLA, et cetera, in order to get uh, high frequency data and not just rely on first? Ah, so for, uh, for, the, uh, for this project, we don't have a plan to uh, use uh, UGMRT or uh, uh, EVLA, the idea is that we have lots first in uh, VLASS. Now VLASS is still in its uh, young stages, but uh, the idea is that we can, uh, because we need some kind of uniform selection of uh, sample and for this catalogs are the best way to go. Uh, for now, we have not planned expansion with UGMRT, uh, but in uh, when we find objects, the idea is that we'll find enough hopefully find enough restarted objects and enough objects with uh, at higher redshifts for which we would like to follow up uh, in detail with uh, UGMRT, especially H1 with UGMRT. Uh, so yeah, that I'm sure will follow. If not me, then somebody else, but uh, from this project, but we do have, uh, we have thought Thank about you. it. Yeah. So you are unmute if you are uh, saying something. Uh, okay. Is someone saying something? I can't. Oh uh, yeah, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. So uh, I had a question about the restarted phase of the of these AGNs. So uh, I yeah. didn't exactly catch how like what what mechanism uh, drives the uh, the restartation basically this process. So can you explain that? Yes. So it's actually one of the biggest uh, problems in this field, open problems in this field. Uh, we've been trying to understand what exactly happens. Why does the 
accretion stops if it does and what leads to this engine being uh, starting again does it suddenly get fed by fed is it suddenly fed with a reservoir of gas uh, in the center or uh, is there some kind of interaction with another galaxy that's changing it so far samples that have tried to study let's say optical properties of restarted galaxies and remnant galaxies and regular active galaxies they don't find significant difference between the host galaxy properties they find that they all come from the same parent population so it's it's right now there is no conclusive idea a conclusive result to say this is exactly why we see restarted phases okay. yeah so, does anyone from offline audience have any questions? Yeah, you can come in. Oh, hi, uh, that's a very nice overview. So the question I want to ask is like the spectral index that you uh, used. So is it average over the whole, uh, the plumes and the hot spot we see are the index correspond to the hot spot or which feature does it correspond because it's a very extended structure there that you are uh, yeah. talking about yeah yeah that's a, that's a good question because uh, that is the new thing with these objects now um that is yeah let's see oh no let's say this one so yeah if you were to now observe all of the, if you had sort of um, low resolution telescope you would see all of this in uh, as one point so what you would measure as a spectral index would just be a, uh, an average of in some sense of all these all these uh, all these parts the average would depend on which part is the brightest so if the hot spot is the brightest then it would heavily weigh uh, it would have a higher weight in the spectral index but now with we have telescopes that can resolve out this emission or not resolve out, but spatially resolve this emission, which means we can individually study these different parts and we can measure the spectral index and all other kinds of properties individually in these regions. So we can really, so that's what this slide is trying to show that we are now resolving out spectral index across the lobe in these regions because we can really, uh, we have really good spatial resolution. Yeah, so the one you have is, uh, uh, I mean, the one you have used for plot is, is it uh, for a hot spot reason or uh, is it just a compilation from the literature so far? Or uh, what is spectral index that you are saying that there is a dichotomy like the second last slide, I think, the blue and the red uh, data that you have plotted. Yes. No, uh, where you have a spectral index versus uh, flux plot, I think. Uh, or, Here? No? Uh, you I'm sorry. To... Uh... Um, you yeah, the spectral there index are 150 AGN uh, uh, radio galaxies that you have taken or something on the uh, just the questions. Yeah, this one. So the red and the yeah. yeah so, so yeah. yeah, yeah. So these this is a sample uh, plot uh, from the VLASS survey with the VLA. Uh, here, each point represents one galaxy. Yes. So the idea here is that if we go to high enough resolution. And we just look at the central region of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. One point here represents that central region. Okay. So we don't resolve the central region here. So if so, when you're studying a sample of galaxies, uh, it's especially if you have like thousands of objects, like in this plot, it's because it's really hard to spatially resolve out resolve these uh, spectral properties for all the galaxies, because uh, you need really high quality images across multiple frequencies, which you don't always have especially in surveys, you don't get that. So that is not done usually for samples. For samples, we can still uh, look at one part of a galaxy with high resolution and each dot represents one part of that galaxy. And then over a statistical uh, study, we can still get an idea of how these radio agents uh, behave. Uh, okay, and just uh, another question is like, uh... What is the reason behind just going for O3 and HI lines uh, uh, rather than ah. there are maybe many other lines? Yeah. So um, O3, one of the reasons it's it's both, I guess, scientific and uh, technical. Scientific part being that O3 is uh, is in the narrow line region. So this cartoon that I showed, you see these gray clouds. Yep. 
this is where o3 is usually the o3 from the in the age and of course there's other o3 as well in the galaxy but this is the o3 we're trying to probe so uh we are trying to understand the interaction of jets with the clouds as that surround it so one of the reasons we go for o3 is because you know o3 emission from these clouds is is from these clouds so if we study these clouds we are study we can study jets interacting with the with the host galaxy ism technical reason is that o3 is much easier to detect compared to other spectral lines it's very strong in these galaxies so we can detect it for more number of galaxies so if you want to study a sample you want high detection rates you want to be able to say something for a large number of objects uh for h1 we study well H1 is actually the most abundant fuel uh, in these galaxies. Um, H1, the case is not that strong. Personally, I also uh, do not use H1 a lot because it's harder to detect. It's very, it's a very faint signal. It's much harder to detect, and therefore we are very limited by uh, what we see in these AGNs. And also in H1 absorption, we don't exactly know where the signal is coming from. All we know is that it's it's in front of the AGN. We don't know exactly which part of the AGN it's coming from. So those are the reasons I we pick O3 and H1. But O3 in this study, O3 would be the uh, main hero. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I actually had one more question from the slide where you showed the spectral spectrum of uh, 3C293. Uh, Can you go back to that slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I, I'm I'm not I, I mean I don't know much about the at all about the how the normal spectrum for the galaxy or for the AGN is supposed to look, but uh, I, I see that uh, the left lobe and the right lobe doesn't show a very symmetric uh, sort of structure. So is it supposed yeah. to be that way or is there any specific reason for that? Uh, uh, so the what you see in the sky is actually a projection of these galaxies. Uh, the galaxies are oriented in three dimensions, but you see in, it in 2D. So a lot of times you see radio galaxies where you'll see one jet, one arm, and not the other. That doesn't mean it's not there. It's just that it's pointed away from you. And the other one's pointed towards you. So it appears much brighter. Uh, it's something called relativistic beaming. So in this case, the uh, one of the reasons why the southern lobe is much fainter is because it's, it's, uh, its viewing angle is such that it's away from us. And Secondly, this, this asymmetry that you're seeing here, this red region is uh, not real. It's a physical artifact of uh, the limitations of the images we had. Uh, the images at higher frequencies were not good enough in the sense that there were, there were calibration errors that couldn't be resolved that affect very low surface brightness emission. So the emission here, as you can see from the contours, is lower surface brightness. It's strongly affected by that. So this is not a very physically, physically real spectral index. This jump, sudden jump, is not real. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, do we do we have any more questions from offline audience? And do we have any questions from the online audience? Okay. Great. So maybe we can move on to the next talk. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Ranoda. So the next talk will be uh, by. Pravita from MS18 and it will be an offline uh, talk as in the speaker will be joining us offline. So just give us five minutes and we'll set, set the things up here and we'll come back in five minutes.
Um, am I audible to the online audience? Yeah. We can't. We can't hear. Okay. okay. Is this on Yeah, yeah. Did we just keep it on the laptop speaker? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, can you ask someone to talk from their side and see the, if this works? It's not detecting the. No, no. Okay. That's what I'm saying. This yeah, yeah. Okay. Very nice. Okay. Okay. Uh, am I audible to the online audience? Yeah, we can hear you. Hello? Can you for a while? We can hear you, but are you sharing any slides? Okay, so yeah, we are back and uh, the next talk and the last talk of uh, the session and of our symposium will be by Pravita Halur from uh, MS18 batch. I'll quickly introduce her. Pravita is currently a fourth year undergraduate student at Isa Mohali pursuing her uh, physics majors. She has been working with Dr. Leah Maitros from uh, IAS Princeton since the summer of 2020. She's currently working on uh, black hole accretion, specifically with GMR GRMHD simulations. Uh, she will continue to work with uh, Leah for her thesis also. In today's talk, uh, Pravita will talk about her summer project work, discussing the use of PCA method in generating images, particularly of the AGM sources from the observations of the Event Horizon Telescope. It is great to have you here, with, uh, especially for the offline audience as well. And uh, with that, I'll hand over to Pravita. Uh, thank you, Prajakta. Um, I hope I'm audible to everyone. So uh, the title of my talk is Imaging AGN Sources with the Event Horizon Telescope. So I hope everyone here knows about the EHT and knows about the first ever black hole image that was created in 2017. And that was with the Event Horizon Telescope. Just to brief you a little bit about the telescope. It is a... Sorry. Yeah. So the Event Horizon Telescope is a VLBI instrument. So why we need this technique at all is because the sources that we're trying to uh, observe are very small in the sky. So it's like taking a photograph of an orange sitting on the moon. So it's very hard and we need a telescope with a very high resolution. And the resolution that we're trying to achieve will, uh, we need a telescope which is as big as the Earth, which is obviously not physically possible. So what we do is there are, um, like telescopes spread across the globe and um, all these telescopes together make an observation and it makes use of the fact that the earth is rotating. So as the earth rotates, each pair of telescopes traces out one of these curves and these points are in the Fourier domain. So I'll get to what that means, but each of these telescopes is a radio telescope and it makes an observation over a period of time. And of course, each pair of telescopes traces out one of these curves, but you can see that like um, there are these gaps in the data, so it's not complete. There are all these gaps. And before we try to make an image out of this data, we need to fill in these gaps. So we need to fit them. So talking a little bit about the 2D Fourier transform. So these are spatial images of simple 2D sine waves. So this is a sine wave, and this is the corresponding Fourier transform. So 
the magnitude of a vector in the UV space gives the frequency and the direction gives its orientation. So if this is the origin and this is the point, this is a single frequency and the orientation gives you how that angle is oriented in my image. So the second image is another sine wave which is flipped by 90 degrees and it is a smaller frequency. So the point is closer to the origin and it is the orientation is flipped. This angle, this sine wave is along the 45 degree line, which reflects again in the Fourier space. And this one is a linear combination of the first two with the same frequency. And again, you can see that it is made up of these two points. So essentially, when you take a Fourier transform, it gives you information about how much frequency is pre how much of what frequency is present in that image. So in theory, we can say that every image is made up of corresponding Fourier components. So we can assume that it's a complete set. And when we take a Fourier decomposition or a Fourier transform, we get a weighted sum. So we have alpha into this image plus beta into this image plus gamma into this image and so on. So yeah, taking a Fourier transform of an image gives me the frequencies that make up that image and how much of each frequency makes up that image. So now um, imaging with EHT is hard as I mentioned, because of the sparse data. And we have multiple algorithms to try and do that. And because of the sparse coverage, there are an infinite number of images that can actually fit this data. So multiple images, the Fourier transform that looks like the data that we have. So how do we pick from all of these images, what is the image of our source? So we can make certain assumptions, like for example, smoothness. We can assume that my image is smooth and doesn't have any sharp edges. We can assume that it has centralized emission, which means that it has emission closer to the center and not much close to the edges. But even after imposing these assumptions, um, there are certain artifacts that are created in the reconstruction. So these, this is the image that you're trying to reconstruct. And the reconstruction has like these naughty blobby structures. The ring is uniform, but the reconstruction is not. And there is always like an attempt to make these algorithms better. And to do that, uh, my guide, Leah, she tried to make an algorithm and she has made an algorithm using PCA. So the point of this is that we take many black hole simulations and we apply PCA on them. I'll get to PCA eventually. But the point is that we say that the image that we're trying to make is not only consistent with the data, but also consistent with the simulation. So it is it broadly lies in the space that is spanned by all these simulations. And it's, it's like a painting set or a blueprint that you're trying to give the algorithm. Like this is what the image should look like. The restraint, however, is that this is very specific to the source. Like my, if I'm giving it uh, images of M87, I am imaging M87. So it's very specific to the source. But what if I want an algorithm which is agnostic to the underlying source? What if I want something more general, which is not specific to the, the black hole that I'm trying to image, but just a general algorithm? that would mean that my training set also has to be general. And why I even need that is because EHT also makes observations of AGN sources. Of course, its primary targets are M87 and SAG star, which is you know, zoomed into the event horizon scales, but that is not, those are not the only sources that are observed by the EHT and we need algorithms to try and image AGN sources as well. So this is a plot like showing uh, how easy it or hard it is to um, image these particular sources. So on the x-axis, we have the EHT resolution in Schwarzschild radii, and on the y-axis, we have the flux at 1.3 millimeters. So 1.3 millimeters is the wavelength at which EHT makes its observations. So the obvious choice is the sources that lie in the top left, that is Sagittarius star and M87, because we can zoom in very close to the center of the black hole, and it is high enough flux that it's easy to observe. We also have sources in this purple triangle, which again have a high enough flux, but they're more zoomed out. They're not very close to the black hole, but we it's still worthwhile to try and image these and you know do interesting physics out of it. So what like again, to image AGN sources, I don't want something very specific to the black hole. I want something more general. So we looked at something called the red noise power spectrum. So don't look too much into the equations. I'm just gonna walk you through this plot. So this is a power spectrum. Simple curve saying that at lower frequencies, I have a higher um, magnitude or intensity, and at higher frequencies, I have a low intensity. That's it. Then Q min is the first break in the spectrum. Q max is the second break in the spectrum, and alpha is the slope between Q min and Q max, and it is governed by this red noise power spectrum equation. Now, how I make this into a, an image is 
in the fourier domain in the fourier space each point has two components one component is the magnitude and one component is the phase so the visibility amplitude is governed by the power spectrum but we give it a random phase which will output an image which has a general like blobs which are governed by this spectrum but the locations of the blobs and the shape of the blobs is random so this image is sort of an example of the space of red noise images that we can make and each of them has a different value of alpha and cumin so as we go to the right alpha decreases and as we go down cumin increases and the effect of both of these is that the size of the blobs decreases now each of them has the same phase because i just want to showcase how the size decreases but now for my algorithm itself i pick just one of these parameters and i make thousands of these with random phase fluctuation so i get around we used around 8000 for this but we get thousands of images which are randomly generated but the size of these blobs is broadly consistent with my power spectrum so to um, repeat i take one of these images i give it i keep giving it random phase fluctuations for about 8000 images and i input it in my pca algorithm now i keep talking about pca but i haven't defined it yet so it's very simple Uh, PCA diagonalizes the covariance matrix to find an orthogonal eigen basis such that the first few PCA components accounts for the majority of the variance in the training set. Now this is a handful, but uh, it's very simple. So this is a two-dimensional uh, plot of data, and each point is correlated in a different way with the other points. And as you can see, the, in this direction, the uh, data is more spread, or it has the maximum variance. And in this, the orthogonal direction, it has the next most variance and what pca does is that it rotates your coordinate basis and it aligns it to minimize the correlations so now if so this is my first pca component and it points in the direction of the maximum variance and the length of that vector is proportional to the variance in that direction and the second one is orthogonal to that and points in the next maximum variance so this is just in two dimensions you can extend that in higher dimensions why this is important is that in in most astrophysical applications the data that we get is highly correlated so if we want to compress this data or process this data in such a way that is more efficient we apply pca to them and then we get that the first few pca components represents most of the information that is in my data set so we've performed a dimensionality reduction that's why generally pca is used so this next slide is a little bit mathy but it's very simple i'll try and walk you through it so in the hyperspace of images each image is n by n pixels and there are m such images let's say there are m such images we can define the matrix a such that a is equal to i1 i2 up to i n i2 up to i m where i k each of these vectors is a column vector of all the points in that image so let's say we pick up kth image in my ensemble i take all the points and i arrange it into one column that will give me n square points and there are m such images so this matrix is n squared cross m now we can define a covariance matrix c as a a transpose and the dimensions of that will be n square cross n square and this measures how the variation in the brightness of each pixel across the ensemble of images is correlated to the variation of brightness in every other pixel so to put it simply this is just a huge matrix of like all the correlations possible in my data set how every pixel is correlated with every other pixel now i just diagonalize this and i hope everyone knows basic uh, linear algebra so just c uk is equal to mu k into uk where uk is my eigen vector and mu k is the corresponding eigen value and the eigen value just gives the percentage of variance corresponding to that eigen vector so if my eigen value for that eigen vector is high it accounts for more variance in my data set and if the eigen value is low it accounts for lower variation in the data set now what does pca actually look like on red noise so this is an illustration of that let's say that this is a hyperspace containing thousands of red noise images i apply pca to this and i get this is, i'm showing the first three principal components so you can see that they look very different from my training set this is just a big bright blob and these two are like divided into two regions and this these are my first three principal components and what i can say is that the first few pca component spans a space that contains these original images so like to put it trivially when you have a 2d real plane you have 0,1 and 1,0 which are your basis vectors and every point in this plane can be represented as a linear combination of your basis vectors just like that if i just take the first few pca components and you know 
make a linear combination, I can essentially represent every image in the original sample. An example of that is if this is my image from my hyperspace, I can project this onto my basis vectors, get its corresponding amplitudes, and then take a linear combination. And this is my resulting reconstruction. So of course, you lose some of the details or some of the resolution, but you can get a broad idea of where the image is bright and where the image is dark, which is essentially what we need for purposes of PhD or other VLBI instruments. So yeah, you do lose some of the resolution, but you get a general idea. So I hope everyone's able to see what we've done here. We've reduced the space of 8,000 images to just 30 or 40, and these 30, 40 images can represent the entire data that is present in my original set. Talking a little bit more about the PCA components, there is some interesting symmetry that is going on. Um, like uh, two and three divide the space into two regions, but it's just rotated with respect to each other. Uh, four and six divide the space into three regions, five and seven divide into four regions and so on. And you see a certain level of symmetry all the way to 20 components. And then this is 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. And this is just to show you that the size of the uh, structures in the PCA component decreases as you increase the component number. That's about it. And of course, the eigenvalue percentage is shown on the top left of each image. Um, this is just a little movie, again, showing the same thing. There is some sort of rotational symmetry going on. And there is also the fact that the size of the structures decreases as you increase the component number. This is um, the eigenvalue spectrum. So don't need to go into the details. It's just how the eigenvalue changes as PCA component number increases. And you can see these step patterns arising because, as I said, there are these similar uh, similar looking eigenvalues that are placed next to each other. So you get these step patterns. Now, again, why is this important for astronomy? Why do I need this basis set at all? So I can make the statement that since my basis set is so general, what if I can reconstruct images that are not even present in my original data set? So if I just take some random image and I want to reconstruct it, what if I just project that onto my basis set and I try and reconstruct it? Can I do it? Because it's essentially agnostic to the source, right? There's no physics involved. So maybe I can, you know, expand this space to images that are not even there in the original set. So this is an example of actually doing that. So these are original images that I'm using, but they're not actual physical images. They are synthetically generated. And these are the reconstructions with 20, 40, 60, and 80. So we project this image onto 20 components, 40 components, 60 components, 80 components. And 20 and 40 already start to reconstruct or reconstruct the general image morphologies, um, which is good because we used 8,000 images. And just with 20 and 40, we were able to reconstruct this image. It was very different from my training set. Of course, as you increase the component number, the image fidelity increases, which is expected. Now, these are images that sort of look like AGN sources. We have the ellipse, and we have the two blobs, and we have a jet-like structure. But we also, even though it was not the original purpose, we also tried to make black hole simulated images. And these are GR GRMHD plus radiator transfer and ray tracing simulations. And like, I mean, we tried to span a space where it is of different kinds of models and different kinds of spins. Here we used more components, 40, 80, 120, and 160, because there were finer details in the image. But again, 40 and 80 already start to achieve the resolution of the published EHT images, which is again, good news, because we don't have to work too hard to try and get something that is that the resolution that we need currently. Um, so this is still everything that I've shown so far is projecting the entire image onto my basis set. But as I've been mentioning, we don't have all the information. We only have sparse information. So so what are the future plans of this uh, project? Uh, fit. So we've been using least squares. We want to move over to MCMC, which is a better fitting technique. And there is an algorithm in play already. It's called Markov chains for horizons. Um, use future baselines to try and fit more data points. So as you add more telescopes to our array, the more we get more data points and then we get better um, images because we have more data points to play with. And in a following paper, use, the, use this algorithm to fit real EHT data. That's the goal. I'm just going to summarize my talk. Um, we generate a PCA basis from random red noise images. So we start from something that is not physical. It is just randomly generated images. 
We show that a completely general PCA basis is able to effectively reconstruct various image morphologies, including geometric shapes and GRMHD simulation images. So images that look very different from my training set, I was able to effectively reconstruct it using this general PC basis. And we were also able to show that this PC basis is able to reconstruct various image morphologies, taking into account the sparse interferometric coverage. So even if I don't have all the information that I need, I can still make an image that resembles what I was trying to make. So again, that is good news. Um, I would like to acknowledge my guide, Leah Mediros, and also Todd Lauer for co-authoring the paper, and uh, thank you. Uh, can, you can you mute yourself? Yeah. Your voice will go from the side. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Ravita, for this wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, so uh, Babla sir has hand raised, so, so you can ask. Yeah. So uh, have you played around with the, how many PCA bases you actually need oh, and sir, uh, have you tried minute. to kind of. Yeah. yeah. Can I go ahead? Yeah. 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 Yes. <clears throat> yeah. So what I wanted to know was if you have ranked your PCA bases in some kinds of a, a signal to noise spaces. Uh, or uh, limit the number of PCA bases that you're using and then see the quality of image reconstruction? Have, have you tried uh, that aspect? Uh, no, 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 uh, yeah, from this okay, so for now, I mean, we haven't done any signal to noise analysis, but um, when we have sparse data, the more components we use, there, you tend to overfit. So there is an optimum number of PCA components that we uh, can use to make the image visually good. Uh, there is, I haven't done any analysis on the, like the exact number of PCA components to use. It is, we just keep increasing the component number and seeing at what point does it give the best fit. Okay, thank you. But maybe you should look for some quantitative uh, estimator of uh, where, which is a good point to stop. Yep, I'll definitely work on that. Thank you. Uh, does anyone from the So you, you talk about the sparse sampling, right? How is sparse that uh, in the, okay, let's, I, I'll take the example of the EHT observation. So how is sparse in the data you can go and still you can recover the image reasonably well? Again, that is not uh, exactly quantified. I have only used EHT baseline so far to do my analysis. So in context of the EHT, it works well. There are other BLBI instruments and it will be sensitive to the baseline that is corresponding to that instrument. Um, but yeah, there is, I mean, it's hard to quantify how sparse it can go and but with the, okay, so if I understood, with the DHT data that you have, you can reconstruct yes. fairly well. Yes. Okay. And in the simulation that you have used, so again, it's the same same question in that domain. So have you tried looking into how it's fast going and like it's still recovering in the sense? Because in the simulation, you can randomly edit any data. Well, mm -hmm. uh, and you sense. still have the idea. No, there is no analysis on how sparse we can go, but we, we stuck to this one baseline and tried to explore other. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions from the online audience? Yeah, okay, great. So, okay, wait. Okay, so I think uh, with this, we can conclude this session. Thank you very much, Ravita. And uh, with this uh, last talk of the symposium, of the session and of the symposium, we will also end the symposium now. Uh, I would like to take this I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers uh, from uh, Prashansa Di to Pravita uh, who, for joining us in the symposium and uh, for for like being with us in this small attempt to bring together the alumni and the current students of the Institute and also to introduce 
uh, the juniors to the field of research uh, through their seniors. I would also like to thank all the audience who, who attended these sessions, these, for, these sessions of the 12 speakers and uh, interacted with the speakers. Um, and okay, yeah. So uh, with that, I would conclude the uh, symposium. And uh, just a heads up that we will be putting the recordings of these all these sessions on club's YouTube channel. And uh, we'll also collect the slides from the all from all of the speakers and make the slides available to the club members at one place and we'll be sending the links and the recordings on the groups and through mail. So yeah.